Okay, thank you so much for having me here. Do appreciate it. Uh, my uh, my seventh chat, chat book had its unofficial launch yesterday at uh, Poets Hall, and uh, if you got five bucks on you, you can probably convince uh, Vertigo to give you a copy in exchange for it. They're in the rack over by his stuff. It's the book called Hitchhikers in Mississippi. And I'm not going to read anything from it, so if you want to hear what's in that one, uh, yeah, everything will be a surprise to you. April 19, 1968, uh, the day after our wedding. It's hot in central Missouri. Three days from now, we'll wake and gaze at snow, five fresh inches covering the motel lot in Flagstaff. Still later, above the breakers and beneath the grim gray birds landing at North Island, there'll be Donax and a fishing float to the south of San Diego. For now, it's not quite sunset. We sit outside the night's room, cooler on the stairs than behind closed doors. Your hair is in curlers, your body in green shorts and a plaid sleeveless blouse. The color of your voice is also still remembered. Uh, number three grandson is a classical musician. Uh, he's up at Oberlin right now in his junior year, I believe. It's hard to keep track of the six of them. Anyway, uh, conversation that he and I had. It's called Little Boxes. Grandpa, he asks, is that punk rock? No child, I reply. Those are the kinks. They were British invasion. Oh, online it says they were proto-punk. Is that a joke, I ask? Like... Nouveau Retro Rockabilly, which was actually a tag applied to a band by a Springfield, Illinois newspaper. Anyway, sidebar. He doesn't get it, nor do I. There's something cosmic not so funny here, though I'm not sure the gods are laughing. Where does it come from, this urge to segregate, classify, mystify? Blacks at that fountain, Jews at that part of the wall, Cubs versus Sox, and damn, that side of the street is Canada. And just how the hell did Question Mark and the Mysterians beget Sid Vicious and the Velvet Underground? Uh, I Thank you. Uh, one of my first influences as a, as a poet was Sandberg. Uh, John forgives me for that. John's a frost man, but uh, I stumbled on him in 1962 as a freshman in high school, uh, reading books in the library rather than sitting in study hall not studying. Rereading Sandberg, there are stories born to be remembered, and young men read them on the train in the early morning, while old men rock next to them dreaming of youth. There are stories that lose their way early or late, and no matter how they're called for in the middle of the night, never quite find their way back from the forest, never quite grow up. There are stories that are written, rewritten years later when the language they speak is extinct, and they mean as much as when they were born. There are stories set to paper for one special woman. And maybe she keeps them in a drawer with old photos. And maybe she spills the morning coffee on them and throws them away, already forgotten. <laughs> Losing my train of thought with the, the thundering applause. Thank you, though. Ina um, Kleina Abend music. Spring has arrived and the windows are open, letting the neighbor's dogs, an ambulance, and travelers flying to somewhere come in. In the basement, great-grandchildren exclaim at old board games and albums of family they never met, family we must now try to remember. The dishes are quiet again. She puts polka music on, convinces her daughter to dance between the island and the sink. 
Their husbands look up, say, hey, it's your deal. Return to their team's latest loss. Shuffling feet, shuffling cards, interweaving conversation filled with easy silences. The fans cheer a homer, the clock ticks, and the band plays on. It's called After the Fall. In those days, the ones that came before all this, before the sudden, always random survival of a few, we collected things. Not a hoarder's gold, but a magpie's glittering treasure. Some clung tightly to rare coins, pieces of paper that were equivalent, paintings, sculptures, cars, graceful carriages and shoes as though traveling these empty roads backwards in time. Now we have what a horse can carry. Clothes for the changing seasons, the evening's meal and its needs, a photograph of Carmelita and, yes, a book of poetry. Chronophobic uh, triptych. Chronophobia is a real thing that I stumbled across. And it was one of those, wow, followed by a head slap saying, well, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Chronophobia is basically suffered by two groups of people. Prisoners, for whom time never passes, and old people for whom time never stands still. Good reason to be afraid of it. On the left panel, the old man attends the funeral. The words of the priest is comfort, comfort for those still confined who wait on their release with longing and anxiety. The centerpiece. He walks early spring streets as the yellow buses stop. He recalls when his children filled the sidewalks and lawns with noise and smiles and later first held hands. One August afternoon, newlyweds move in where the widow Johnson lived in a self-made nunnery. The kids on the block feared getting their ball from her yard. His daughter and grandson visit a bit more often to keep at bay the leaves refilling his lawn like scarves cascading from the hat of a stage magician called upon to fill idle family afternoons. This many steps to the door, this many more to make it down the snow-touched driveway. Right at the corner, right, left, no, damn it, right, and right, home. Fooled you again, time. Right panel. Six men, good and strong, to carry the slight weight, the soulless shell, alone left. Memories grow heavier, but in the end we leave them to burden other shoulders. Okay, it's Halloween, so every good poet, I guess, should have at least one vampire poem. I got two. I got two. Uh, Railing at the Light takes its impulse from a Scottish proverb that was etched on the wall of a bar that we were having a meeting in, a real honest to God meeting. Uh, and there's argument whether it's Irish or Scottish, but the proverb goes, they speak of my drinking, but never my thirst then I will speak of it. Though they fear the sound of my voice, of my tread, the threat of their being breaking with a rail at my lips. I was cast into life like any of them, expelled from the wound to cry around the blood and after birth to change. And I was sucked into death and beyond, drained of what I was to cry out for blood and afterward be only the same. Bloodless, I thirst to briefly fill my veins again. Sashed, I hunger for something, someone, anyone to warm the emptiness. The ages blur in passing, but the hours, the nights, they crawl, stretching like my shadow at a door when clouds betray the moon. God, who might love me still as I love you or not, do I compound the blasphemy when I feel forsaken? I used to love the rising sun. Back in the beginning of the century, uh, this particular century, I co-moderated a 
a, a writing group online. And the woman I co-moderated with had this thing for vampires. Uh, not a healthy thing for vampires. She had a, a thing for vampires. So this is one vampire's wish uh, for Kai. Who told you vampires never age? That's a crock. I'll bet they told you we only drink the blood of virgins, too. Where do they get this stuff? I'm so old, virgins just don't do it. There have been so many. It gets boring, and frankly, I'm not all I used to be. You know what I mean? My joints ache when the moon throbs on the horizon. Thunder hurts my ears. And the rain is hard to fly through. You try it sometime, OK? All I really want is someone to come home to, a woman to rub my feet and tell me I'm forgetful but not batty, to sit around the house and have a drink with. <laughs> For those of you who ever got into science fiction prose, uh, probably the best anthologies that were ever assembled were done in the late 50s through the 60s by Judith Merrill, the, uh, the Canadian editor. Uh, I've got a complete set, uh, most of which I bought when they first came out. Bus trip downtown Chicago from the suburbs as a 13-year-old to get to Crock and Brentano's. Uh, and I suspect most of us are old enough to remember Crock and Brentano's. Uh, one of the poems that she included as, as a rare nod was uh, taken from mid-century by John Dos Passos. It's called Three Prologues and an Epilogue. It was written in 54, 55, and uh, 60 years later, probably the things Dos Passos talked about are no different. Paz y Amor, one. The dog wakes the man insistent. They step out into the pre-dawn. Above, a speck of comic, cosmic dust traces its brief, shallow arc before the farther stars. From the windbreak trees, a squirrel chatters, teasing. The dog lifts his ears, stands still and stiff. The man laughs lightly, looks west to the moonset. Two. Halfway through the second decade, lives removed from another dawn, a shadow nibbles at the moon's cheek. Focused on more pressing matters, the dog investigates the meadow, finds nothing, returns to the man. The man rests his head on the dog's head, wonders what the brain beneath the bone might make of satellites that search the stars and horoscopes that seek to explain the passions that ebb, ebb and flow like tides inside his human companion. Three. A car runs slowly on the county two lane. Windows open, judging from the sound of guitars, drums, and voices trying to explain love between a man and a woman and peace between a student and teacher. Good luck with love, the man thinks, knowing why he lives alone now. And with that peace thing, yeah, knowing why he lives miles away from cities at this end of his years away from the tides of discord. Four, the dog, perhaps the wiser one, scents something in the hedgerow and abandons the hand of man at a full run with a full bark, eager to be a satellite himself circling the world he knows. The man instead turns to the light shining through the curtain windows, seizes, his or ceases the orbit of his thoughts and courses for re-entry, eager to settle in an ocean of sleep until the sun shines down again. Five, and finally, the dog, sensing a treat in lieu of whatever he was chasing, catches up to the man. They walk across the night black grass, the man reciting to the stars as the dog listens closely. This is the way the world will end. This is the way the world will end, not with a bang, but a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, dying in a manger, unattended by any form of wisdom. 
Every once in a while, I'm guilty of trying to do prose poetry. Sometimes it succeeds. I think this one probably does. Under the Lash. As if the longing is something she can ignore or take her mind off of for any serious length of time, like burning the roof of her mouth on a slice of pizza or getting cut off in traffic by some clown who flips her the bird. It's three in the morning. Sleep is hiding somewhere under the bed. And she surrenders, admits and accepts that she is flagellant about his absence from any nearby state, save imagination. Standing before the, bedroom, the bathroom mirror, she carefully composes the photograph. One earringed ear among the thick, bright hair. The sweep of corded muscle from behind the jaw to the shoulder and arm. Straight, strong, seductive clavicle and the upper slope of a breast. Back among the covers, she decides that perhaps we can only share the longing, not get rid of it. And so she sends the image thinking, let's see if he can get any sleep now. <laughs> Birds in love. When it rains on the beach in October, the migrators think about Cabo. It doesn't count that this is South California, the place they thought heaven when they fledged, or that this isn't the west coast of Lake Michigan, where the frosts could have chilled them to death by now. No, the clouds have taken angry faces, and so it's time to find a changeless, changeless place. The wise ones, however, take their chances, stay. They've seen this play out before, know the weather will change again. Nature's a series of constant cycles. And with every year, they realize a truth. Living in a strange land is far colder. And last, tangled in the wreckage. What you never forget at first is that you weren't the one who changed. You weren't the one who left in the middle of the day without giving notice that this kiss was the last one to be expected. What you never forget later is that you carry your share of guilt. You also could have done more right or at least less wrong. And so there are no accountings, no assignments of final blame. What you never forget finally is that the memories are good things, are among the gifts given you to last a lifetime of sunrises, get you through the darkest nights, and share at every chance. Thank you. <laughs>